paragraph number four, right? Bezet Hashem, uh, because we're right before Purim, we're now like within the month of Purim. I already mentioned some some connections between Purim and the Torah. The ones that stick out so far is the Indian of Mordechai, being the Indian of Halacha, Halacha Psuka, the, the the clarification of Emuna through Beru Halacha. That's why it says in the end of the Megillah, Doresh Tov Lamo. Vidoresh Shalom Lechozaro, right? So it's at the end of the Megillah that says that Mordechai was Doresh Shalom, Doresh Tov, he was, he was Darshan good, he was a good Doresh, which could mean a few things. Like Doresh means he was always concerned for the Yidin, Doresh Tov Le'amo, always being concerned for the Yidin, for the good for the Yidin, for the Jews, but also it's from the word Drasha, Drush in Torah, the Muda Torah. Doresh Tov Le'amo, that Mordechai had the Koach of the positive Drush. Of being Doresh the Torah in the in the in the positive sense for his nation, and then he continues with Doresh Shalom. And he speaks Shalom lechol amo. What Shalom in the context of this Torah? Shalom is the idea of learning halacha, because he says Veda ma shetashiv lepikoris is Rashi Tivot Shalom. And we said in the beginning of the lesson, if you remember, that to know how to answer the atheist is by learning halacha. Learning halacha. Psak halacha is the shalom of the Torah. In, in this, this, uh, there's two versions of this lesson in Likutei Moran. There's this Samech base. If you look in the back, you have what's called uh, additional manuscripts. Tosafot. There's addition to the Likutei Moran. In that version of this lesson that Rav Nosen found in 1824, somebody came to him and brought him a whole stack of Rabbeinu's handwritten uh, Ketav Yad documents, manuscripts. And it was a different version of this lesson. I said it already a few times, but it's good idea to hear this. It's amazing. And there's so many differences between this lesson, which is also Lashon Rabbeinu. It's Rabbeinu's wording word for word. That means Rabbeinu dictated how this lesson should be word for word. The, ones we're learning, the one we're learning in the actual Likutim 1, Lesson 62. And the second version also is Lashon Rabbeinu. And Rav Nosen points out, look at this, that even Rabbeinu, between writing a lesson and giving it over, he would have more differences, more Shinuim would come up, more differences. He wrote the lesson already, but then when he, opened, when he gave it over to Rav Nosen, Again, he made changes. Even though he wrote it down already for himself, he made more changes. And Rav Nosen says, this is the, the, the depth of Rabbeinu. However, he printed both, right? We have in the back, like I said, the second version. And there he says, the Torah has many parts, right? The Torah is also Rafua, the Torah is Simcha, and the Torah is also Shalom. And each area of the Torah has a different attribute. What is the Shalom, the peace of the Torah? That's what's called Psak Halacha. Psak Halacha, it makes peace between the Machloket, Beit Shammai, Beit Hila, Psak. Psak Halacha is the peace in it, right? Rabbi Yudah, Rabbi Meir, Psak. So that's the idea of Shalom, and then that the Megillah calls Mordechai, right? Doresh, Doresh, the Doresh Shalom the Zaro, that he speaks words of peace, shows that Mordechai is the idea of Psak Halacha. And also Mordechai, all these ideas, by the way, you can find in a, in a beautiful book in Hebrew. It's called uh, Rashi B'Samim Rosh or Rashi B'Samim. What's the book? There's a book that he, he connects every lesson in Likuti Moran to Purim. Rashi B'Samim, I think it's B'Samim Rosh. It's a rough month in New York, a breast liver, an undercover breast liver. He's a brisker. And he wrote a whole sefer connecting every lesson in Likuti Moran to Purim. What's amazing about it is that if you're learning a lesson in Likuti Moran, and you read what he's saying before Purim, it gives you the highest, you know, you connect what you're living, what's happening now, to the Torah of the Moran. And the man is so, so bright and so bucky in the whole Torah, so when you see the Ksharim mix between the Megillah and the lesson of the Moran, it's so amazing how Rabbeinu, his lessons fit in perfectly, it's hidden in everything. Like he said, like Rabbeinu said in, uh, in uh, Sichot Taran, in Rabbi Nachman's Wisdom, and also in Chaim Moran, that with one lesson in Likutei Moran, you can go through the entire Shas, the entire Midrash, the entire Zohar, the entire Kitvi Arizal, the entire Tanakh, the entire Bible. You can go through the whole Torah using one lesson. You can find the ideas of one lesson throughout the entire Torah. It's phenomenal. That's, that's the beauty of, of the rest of teachings of, of Likutei Moran, how, how far it goes. So in Purim, there's a lot, because Purim is something so emphasized by Rabbi Nachman, by Rabbi Nelson, about the, the greatness of Purim, and there's so much depth into it. So again, so we have the idea of Mordechai with the idea of Halacha. Haman, we say, if Haman, the, 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 the Chazal teach, Haman mina Torah minayin. Where is Haman hinted to the Torah? Where it says, Hamina etz, right now, Hashem asked Adam Arishon, could it be that from the tree in which I told you not to eat of, the tree of, good of, knowledge, uh, the tree of knowledge of good and bad, etz adat tovah, I told you not to eat from the tree, did you eat from it? Hamin. 
So Haman is hinted that he is the bad of the tree of knowledge of good and bad. And we started the lesson that, that when you eat, that the eating has to be that it's only your, the good in the food, that there's no mixture of ra. All food we eat has tova ra, and the yid, when they eat, we elevate the good and subdue the bad in the food. And if not, Chas Shalmi says in the beginning of the lesson, the bad in the food which you, can't, you didn't subdue, whether because you didn't say bracha properly, or the kashrut of the food, or the holy sparks are not ready, but he says all this is in the category that your emunah is not strong enough, then the bad in the food can bring you down and cause you to sin. And that's why he says in his lesson that eating and drinking is the main ta'ava, even above all the other ta'avas, even this ta'avas for niuf and ta'ava for abrit and ta'ava for mani, but the main thing is akhira because that's the gateway. If it's not subdued that time that bad, then it can overpower a person. So we see Haman, behind the story in the Midrash, it says that he's the one who pushed Achashverosh to make the Seuda for the Yidim. You see in the beginning of Megillah Esther, that Achashverosh, when he became finally, on the third year of his kingdom, he made a Mishteh of 180 days. That was for the whole, all the nations, that was for all the ministers, that was a, that was a public Seuda. And then at the end, another seven days for Shushan, and it says there, La'amo. And the Midrash says, Amo means for the Yidin. He made a special Suda <coughs> for the Yidin, for the Jews only. Why? So they explain, the Midrash explains, that it was under the Eitza of Haman in order to make the Kitrug, the, the attack against the Yidin so strong, he wanted to get them to eat them properly. Mordechai warned the Yidin, don't go to the Suda. Don't, it's a trick. It's a, it's a, it's a plan that they're, they're, they're trying to find an opening to bring you down. 18,544 Yidin, that's the exact number as brought down in the Yal Kuchimoni. 8,544 Jews who lived in Shushan Abira, they didn't listen to Mordechai, they went to the Suda, and in the Suda they fell. Even though he served, so to speak, some opinions said he served kosher wine, how, I don't know, but the food was Bishul Akum, and Mordechai warned them, careful, the food is Bishul Akum, and also, Achashvosh uh, Begdavka, he brought in Zonot afterwards, Chasashon, to be machshul, all the men who came. And it happened. And the kitchen was so severe that that was the opening to get them down. In our context, Haman attacks through food. Through food. Haman, his koach to bring a person down is in the bad of the food. That's why he says in the beginning of the lesson, the main bearer of eating is emuna, which means work on your emuna first. And then you can eat, you can eat anything. You can eat, like a, you can eat properly and enjoy yourself. If your emunah is intact, you have nothing to worry about the bad and the food to attack you. This whole lesson in Likuti is to come to that, to build your emunah to the level that the bad and the food won't attack you and won't overcome you, won't be misgabber on you. So that's Haman, the bad. And now we're working on the part of Esther. The, se- the second part of the story, the Seifa, is the idea of Esther, we'll get into it. Because he says, Rabbeinu, that person now is trapped, and already his eating is not 100%, so he needs what's called the ta'anit, fast. But it, Rav Nosin explains, and it's, it's, it's also alluded to in the Likutei Tfilis, that since we know from other places that Rabbi was very, Rabbi Nachman was very against people fasting, he said, anyone who comes to me for Rosh Hashanah has no need to fast, and we're talking about optional fast, like ta'anit or shub, it's called. Not, not, not obligatory, we have to fast, like Yom Kippur, Tisha B'Av, Tanit Esther, we're talking about optional fast. And someone who doesn't come to me for Shana, he doesn't, he, he should, it doesn't help, he shouldn't fast. Those who, those, they won't help the fast. Those who come to me don't need to fast. And those who, do, who don't come to me should not fast. So there was fasting he was very against. So, but there are times your person is just so over, over attacked, the person is so into the Taiva Sechila, sometimes it's, it's just overwhelming him. He has no choice but to, call, to do what's called the Hafsaka, he has to stop and do something. So that's the aspect of a Ta'anit. And Rav Nosen Rabbeinu goes into the idea of the Ta'ani basically is to always start from the beginning. To start in any area of Avodah Hashem, we call Ta'anit, because the word Ta'anit is from Inui. Inui means you're a type of a, a prevention. You're causing yourself a, a, a pain in refraining. And Inui means you're, you're causing a type of a, of, a, of a pain due to preventing, refraining, not, allow, not allowing yourself to, to do something. That's the Ta'ani, we're not eating. There's also an inui where a person is preventing himself from something in order to, to start again. But he says by, by starting again, you're not, you're not advancing. You're going back to zero again, and then you, you continue. That's how you advance. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a delight, it's a ta'anuk for a person to always be advancing in life. And here, you're always starting at the beginning 
which is the key for Emuna, by the way. He says that a year always should start from the beginning. This is a type of an Inui, because the, the, the brain, the Sechel, the ego of a person always wants to become somebody. You want to become a doctor, become a lawyer, a BA. To become somebody, it's a Ta'ava. It's a, it's a desire. It's something which you want to you aspire for. Even in Yiddishkeit, I want to finish Shas finally. I want to become a master Kabbalist. I want to have all these things, even in Yiddishkeit. And yet the secret of Yiddishkeit is L'atchil b'chol pam mechadash. What's this? Ashkamata Mokir Gimel. Right. Right, the tiny child. Right, that, 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 that Rav Nassim he says clearly. That the idea, of, we spoke about that in previous classes, that there's what's called tiny child. That, that if you can't do it, the, the normal, the big fast, it's at least fasting before davening. Rabbi Nachman is very strict not to eat or drink before davening. Comes Allah to Shachar, not even to drink water. Even though, according to Allah, there's leniency for somebody who's sick and not well to drink just water. That's it. Not now other things. That's additional. That's more cool as our person's really chalash. They say you can have coffee without sugar and everything. But ideally, you should not to take anything. Because that, that, by doing that ta'anit, that will let the words come out with emunah. Because that builds your emunah. So this, we're going to see it's all connected to Esther. This is the safe, the safe of the Torah, of the lesson. Now we're going to continue. Visit the Okay, so we're holding out in Sif Dalit, paragraph 4. We just started it last week in lesson 62, Torah Samech Beis, Sif Dalit. Right, to complete Emuna. He says now the main way to complete Emuna, and we're going to see if the time it comes to this, is to cure for Chokim. Getting people who are far back to Hashem. <clears throat> and he says this starts by getting the Dibor, collecting the Dibor which has been trapped in the, in the evil. That a person's Dibor, which we will explain the whole process, how it works, how the Dibor, the Yid, by being trapped in the Galut, we can't dub him. So now we have to rescue, we have to elevate the speech. And by doing that, when we elevate the Dibor, the Dibor itself begins to wake up the nations back to Hashem. So look what we're holding now. Towards the beginning of Sif David, we started last week. We're in the the the, the word says Vze bechinat az epoch el amin safa virula. You see that? In the, toward, towards like about four lines after the beginning of uh, Sif David, Vze bechinat it's a pasuk in Sfania. Right? You got it? Az epoch el amin safa virula. So now Rabbi Nachman he's going to take his idea and show you how it's dressed in this pasuk in Sfania about the future, the prophecy of the future. It says there, as Hashem says, then, Epoch, I will turn El Ha'amin to the nations, what's called Safa Ve'urura, a complete, clarified, re refined, pure speech. Safa speech, Ve'urura, Bawo means many things. Pure, refined, clarified, cleansed. Safa Ve'urura. What is Safa Ve'urura? Ha'inu ha'dibo she'nitbarer mi'beinehem. This is, this is just unbelievable. Mamash. The, the Dibur, the speech with it, which we collect from amongst the Goyim, Shanit Bar Mi Benham, which has been collected from the Goyim, he's gonna, he didn't say it how to do this. He's saying this is what we have to do. The speech itself, you don't have to do Kirvah Chokim. The Dibur is an entity, the speech is a force. It's so amazing because you look at the Pshan and the Pasuk, it fits in punct perfectly. As Epoch and Amin, Safa Veruna. What's the Pshat translate? How do they translate according to Pshat this Pasuk? But Basit Hashem says, I will turn to the nations, they'll have one speech towards Hashem. The verse continues, kulam b'shem Hashem Hashem echad. I will turn to the nations one speech, pure speech, that they all will talk to Hashem, they all will dive into Hashem. That's the Pshat. And Rabbeinu Rabbi Nachman says, but look at the actual wording of the, of the Pasuk. Epoch and means that the speech itself will turn to the nations. Safa Berura, the speech which has been clarified, it turns, Epoch and Amin, it turns to the nations. Unbelievable. The word, the speech which you elevated from amongst the goyim, the speech that has fallen, and we're going to see how that happens in the first place. How does Dibur fall into Galut? It, it falls, the, the, how, how does Dibur fall in the first place? We're going to see it's coming up with the idea of Paro, Mitzrayim, and the, the three ministers of Paro coming up. We're going to see how this happens. But this is the problem, that the Dibur is trapped in Galut, and we have to elevate the Dibur. Once that's done, the Dibur itself does the rest of the job. You don't have to, you do a grandma, it's called a grandma. You do the, your part on davening, on elevating speech, and the speech itself brings back all the world to recognize Hashem. 
who offer it to Amin. Why? Why does the Dibur now go after the rest of the nations? Why is he turning himself to the nations? Kedei lilkot mehem sharei nitzatzat akdusha. See, there's two things. There's Dibur, which is also speech, which is also fallen. So it's a, it's like a type of it's a type of spark, but it's not. He doesn't call it nitzatzat akdusha. To explain, Dibur has fallen because of our blemishing speech. <coughs> Where do we blemish speech? We blemish when we don't when we, when we don't dive in bekavana. When we don't dive in bekavana, when we say words which are blemished, also chassam. Person says loshonara nivul pei. He says forbidden speech, but also davening which is not bekavana. So the dibur goes down. So I just read before we go on. So people ask the question: If that's the case, I shouldn't daven. I should only daven when I have bekavana. In fact, it's a lesson in the Kutei Look at lesson ninety-nine. Is it here? No, it's not here. In lesson ninety-nine, he talks about that. So you would think that if I like if not if I if my daven was which is the kavana like the story in the Gemara Rabbi Chanan ben Dosa, as I know that my tefillah is accepted and if it's not the kavana so it's not accepted so I might as well not daven I shouldn't daven if my davening if I see that I'm davening without kavana I have a, I have a hangover I have a headache I'm drained I'm out of it it's not working I might as well not just daven he says Rabbi Nimshah says don't do that why because that one daven that will come along which will be kavana will pull out all the all the fifty tefillahs the hundred tefillahs you didn't daven be kavana. It's worth davening and davening even without kavana, because eventually it will be elevated. And it's needed. That davening, which is shalom be kavana, it's thrown somewhere in the mud, in the refesh, in the teat. And it's there to do a job. It's there to connect the sparks which are there. So now when the dibur, you, you say one davening, which is be kavana, so it pulls up with it all the 100 davenings that you daven without not be kavana, since the last time you daven be kavana. Maybe two years ago, for example, after a person daven be kavana two years ago, and since then he's just dead. I'm not, my davening is dead, it's a burden, it's stones. So you keep on davening every day, and then a year, two years later, comes along another davening, wow, he'd love it. And that davening pulls up all the 150 davenings, or 200, or 300, or 6,000 6, davenings that were, whether, that were out of it. It's worth davening. And that, what does it pull out with it? It pulls out the sparks of holiness that are attached to that davening that, that's been thrown into, in that low level. So that's why it's important to always daven. But we have to strive to daven be kavana. When you don't be kavana, so the davening has a different mission. It goes to the to the refesh, to the klipot, fine, and it's waiting there, dormant, to be elevated. And it's bekavana. You're davening shalom bekavana. You're not doing you it purposely. You're trying to daven your best, and it's not working out. And he says things which in the story are coming up. What can lead that a person won't daven bekavana? The main thing is when the emunah is not complete, and that gives room for the food. We said the bad in the food to trap the speech, to bring it down, the deep work. Okay. Fine, so now with that in mind, you have hidden already before even the Dibur goes down to the Goyim, to the nations, to Galut, you have what's called holy sparks trapped everywhere. In order for the world to exist, even Tuma, even impurity, even the Goyim, even Avodah Zarah, to exist it has to have a spark of holiness. So now, if these sparks of holiness are returned back to their Makor, to their place, then ev- everything that, that is living off of them, they can't, they can't connect to it anymore because the, 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 the holy spark has been elevated, the klipot, the evil, the husks which have been fooling people to live in their way and in their idolatry and their, and their, and their hashkafa, there's no more uh, life source for that, so they have no choice but, but to come back to Hashem. The whole world will come back to Hashem. Even the people the most farthest from Yiddishkeit and Emunah, the going where so far, and when Moshe comes, it'll be... They, they, they have no other op- alternative, no other option to, to continue serving Abu Dazar because there's no chayut, there's no life for them to do that. There's no more nourishment from that, and they will automatically turn to Hashem. So the Dibur does that. The Dibur says, As safa berura, the Dibur itself, which has been rectified thanks to you elevating the speech, the speech itself turns to the, the nation to collect the other sparks of holiness which have been there beforehand, even. Veraz, and he goes on, Mitkayem. That is fulfilled the safe at the end of the Pasuk, which is said, Likro Kula Beshem Hashem. Then the whole world will call to Hashem. He's showing you, Rabbeinu, in this Pasuk, how the process works. It's first, Safa Berura, elevating. Elevated first, Safa Berura, which means that it's been pulled out, rectified, refined. And then the Dibur itself turns to the world to collect all the sparks. And when that's done, automatically the going turn to Hashem. Sheid Beku Kula Bemunat Yisrael. Okay, so this is in the future, but even today on a smaller scale, according to how much you work on elevating your dibur, on davening with koach, and davening with kavana, and for example, when you daven with this attitude, that when I'm davening, 
it's a battle. It's a it's a war. It's a war. I'm now with my davening, with kavana. I'm it's it's I'm trying to daven with kavana in order to elevate. See, in the Likuti Moran, there's many attitudes of davening. There's someone who davens out of ahava, out of light, because they're giving him a light from above to experience this joy. It's also the idea of azamra is connected to this to this Torah. It's like collecting the good from the bad. When you're davening, it's like you're in darkness, and now you're trying to sift out. Every word is a good, is a drop of good. And that goodness that you see in the word enhances the kavana of the word. It gives you the simcha, the or, the connected, you see it, and that works on the process of elevating the words. So this attitude, Rabbeinu is giving us an attitude of how it is normal, how it should, how it is until Mashiach comes, how it is in Galut. In Galut, there's only Choshech. When you're davening, you're holding on to like a, a, a flashlight, you're holding on to a beacon of light, and if you are aware that this is the light and, and the Choshech is uh, trying to attack and you have that clear that there's a separation of good and bad as opposed to the Yetzirah which tries to mix everything when you're davening just to mumble with all types of thoughts which are just attacking you all types of machshavot that are attacking you so that there's a mixture of the good and bad together as opposed to here where now you do a birur the bad is here and the good is here the word is good I'm now with the word now I'm with Baruch Shamar, Raya Olam, I see only the word, I see the light, I see the good, the bad, I know it's attacking me, I recognize it, and I'm not going to be fooled into thinking that it's part of the davening. It's separate, then you do the job. That's called Birur. That gives you the Kavana, because you're focusing anyways on the word, because of your attitude in the davening. Your attitude in the davening is, I'm in a mission to collect the good from the bad, to do Birur. You see the word, he's, he's the word Birur. And in Torah 54, where it talks about the idea of Azamra, Birur. For nigunim, you're picking out the good nigun from the bad nigun, and also nazam aresh mebet, you're picking out the good from the bad. The word berur is that is that you're taking the good from the bad. Also, the kavana is that the davening with concentration is that you're focusing on the good, and you can see it. You can only focus on the good if you feel the darkness around you. So you're like you're trying to heat yourself up and cover yourself with the with the good that you have with you. And that's the word. All I have is this letter of baruch bet, and then resh, and then vav chaf, like he says in lesson sixty five. Right? So that attitude gives you the kavana, that when you, when you realize that. But you need a schut for that also. It doesn't happen every day. Most people, they cut the davening and their head is not even there before the davening. They forget about these ideas. As much as they learn about it and daven about it, you need a schut. That's what this lesson is coming to teach us. How to activate that the word, the speech is elevated. Okay? So now we start. See if, hey, paragraph 5. Ulaalot mitzotzea dibur. Now, to elevate the sparks, you see, he said originally, Nitzutse Kedusha. Okay, that's the, that's the category of the sparks of holiness, which is keeping alive all the nations and all, everything in existence is by Nitzutse Kedusha. And there's what's called Nitzutse Adibur, right? Our job is Nitzutse Adibur, to elevate the sparks of speech. To do that, Tzarich Leta'anit. Fine. He doesn't say Tzarich Lebechinat Ta'anit. He didn't say in the lesson, you need the concept of Tani, which makes more sense, because really, you see how it goes on afterwards, especially at the end of the lesson, the Kutimran, he connects every time you travel to a tzaddik, you have to come with the attitude that you're coming for the first time, and he connects this to the idea of a fast. So you see that he opens up the idea of Ta'anit. So it would make more sense, he would say, Bechina Ta'anit, but he said Ta'anit, because the main area in life that affects the mood the most is the idea of the eating. The eating in this area. That's what the eating, like you mentioned at the beginning of the, of the, of the lesson. The eating, because it's, it, it's all situated, we in the same area. The speech, where you talk from, the, what's called the Chamesh Motzal Tapeh, the five parts of speech, the, the letters from the Aleph Bet, which are from the tongue, from the teeth, from the palate, from the throat, they're all here. And also, eating is here also. Everything's in this area, so it's right next to it. You're going to see it's coming up. How he explains it? Because of that, food is the area that needs to be sanctified the most in the idea of Ta'anit where I'm always starting again into sanctifying myself to start again, a new day, etc. But he says the extent it applies to everything in Avodah Hashem. Applies to, because the idea is there. To, he explains how Tani works. It's always you're going back to the beginning, always starting fresh from the beginning. So he didn't say Bechina uh, Tanit, and that, like you just showed me in the Likut Anachot, Rav Nosen says, we do have, in, nevertheless, every day, what's called Tanit Shout, right? The fasting for several hours. There's a, part, there's a certain part, part of the day that you not you don't eat. You refrain from eating. What's that time? From the time that you wake up, from the alot shachar, the morning dawn, until you daven, right? That time at least keep it that you don't eat. 
no drinking, no eating nothing at that, that period, that small period. Is it's a short amount of time. Uh, any other time, let's say night time, let's say two hours. Make it. He says that uh, ideally, according to the Zohar, you shouldn't even eat or drink from midnight. Yeah, but most people can't hold by that. And the, 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 that's, that's the somebody, else, somebody wants to say he wants, doesn't want to eat between six and seven at night. Is that, is that, is that, is that that's also in the, uh, the aspect of a tiny child, yes. Yeah, you, you can do it to show us a feed or not. Uh, uh, okay. That requires, I think, a Kabbalah. Oh. Here, by Lota Shachar, it's already instituted oh. by the Chazal. The davening, al to al al to how does it go? al 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 so at least tiny child we have. He, so he, he's here, he didn't say Bechina Tani. But again, if you look in Abbas and Zikutei Tfilis on this Torah, he gives maybe three lines to dub for, for fast, and that's it. He gives three lines about Tani. Mamash, here, let's take a look. Here's Zikutei Tfilis, 62. Mamash, he doesn't give that much for, for free fasting at all. <coughs> Where is it? Where's the fasting part? No? I want to see it here. Devotion of what? Where are you? Here, it's over here, sir. Here, if Chen Ta'azveni Brachamecha Abim Chasadecha Dolin, would Zakin with Anot Ta'anitim Harbe, Big Dushav Tarak Dola, with Simcha of Tu Levav, I'll translate soon, Ketzor Hato Bemet. באופן שיזכה על ידי התעניתים לתקן פגם הדיבור, לחבר אחורי הקדושה ולהוציא את דיבור מהגלות, מגלות פרה ובשר ומצרים. That's it. And then he says, but, <laughs> I'll translate. All, all he says about the fast is that, God in your compassion and love, help me to fast a great deal in holiness and purity, in joy and with a good heart, in accordance with your will, so that I will rectify the blemish of speech and reconnect the, the rear aspect of holiness, אחורי הקדושה, bringing speech forth from its exile, the exile of Pharaoh and the minister of Egypt. That's all Rav says. And then he asks for guidance of Hashem to guide him according to his emet. Avish v'shamayim. And this Rav gives a lot more. Shittachti alecha chapai, horeni Hashem darkecha, onchaini b'orach mishor, v'ma'an shorerai, horeni Hashem darkecha, alech ba'amitecha, yachel levavi l'yela shemecha, adrichaini ba'amitecha, v'rabedini k'yata elohi ishi otcha kibiti kol hayom. עוזרני כי עליך נשענתי, ואנחנו לא נדע מה נעשה כי עליך עינינו, ואני סומך עצמי עליך לבד באמת, ביחצונך אעשה. And he goes off. Chus v'choneinu v'achem manayv l'amdeinu l'asot v'yatsulcha b'emet v'horeinu d'rachecha b'ofen sh'nizke m'erah l'shaber b'emet tabat achina u'shtiya. That's it. No more fasting. There's not any more any any other word about fasting. He gave. It seems to be a major point in the lesson. And Rav Nosson in the prayer gave four lines. And then he said, "Hashem guide me according to your emet." It's understood he said that because on on one hand Rav Nosson said not to fast, and here he's saying yes to fast. The people in the fast. So Rav Nosson gives this whole section. I'll translate it so the people can understand what we just read. My Father in Heaven, I spread my hands out to you. Hashem, teach me your path and guide me upon the straight way, despite those who gaze upon me. Hashem, show me your path. I walk in your truth. Again, guide me that I should go according to your emet. Unify my heart to fear your name. Guide me in your truth and teach me that you are the God of my salvation. I have hope for you every day. Help me because I rely on you. I do not know what to do because my eyes are turned to you. I rely on you alone and I do your will. Teach me how to do your will. Guide me on your path so that I will quickly eradicate my craving for eating and drinking. That's it. He doesn't mention again fasting. That's it. The whole lesson, in the Rav Nossin's prayer, he gives four lines to show you that that's not the main thing. That it's the, it's the idea of the Tanya which, comes in, which then Rav Nossin goes into the idea of starting it always again, being fresh, fresh kaitat chil kopa mechadash. That, yes, Rav Nossin talks a lot about. The person should always be chadesh kanesh and eraychi. I should always be new like, a, like, a, like an eagle. And that Rav Nossin does speak a lot about. But the fast, he gives four lines, and then he says, I shall not know what to do, go ahead according to your admit. Because you know, the fasting, I want to not to fast. He says, you know, on one hand, the Rabbeinu says the benefit of fasting, optional fast, but on the other hand, it's dangerous to fast, because you're going to lose out on, on other areas, and it's not going to help in the end so much, because of what you lose out. But like we said, you have miniature, Rav Nosson says, look with the miniature aspect of the, the everyday, the tiny child before davening, for example. Fine. Okay? So now, La'alot Nitzu Seyad Dibur, where we just left off, Tzarech Letani, you need... The, the fast, and we're going to say the idea of the fast, but also fast itself. And uh, by the way, in Breslov they said, it's because Rabbeinu told us not to fast, so whenever a fast day comes along, like Tani Tester, Tisha B'Av, Tzom Gidalia, Yom Kippur, you grab it like you do it with a, grab a nice cake. You grab it good. In other words, don't, don't find any kulas and leniencies not to fast. 
If a fast does come your way, we're obligated to fast, take it. Also, Rav Nosen writes in the Kut Al-Khot, the Rabbeinu was very for the minhag of fasting up to noon in the Aser Demi Tshuva. Some, some people have the custom fast from after Rosh Hashanah. You have some Tshuva <coughs> until the day before every Yom Kippur. It's not that many days. It's a few days. And like the kids in Shulchan Aruch says, you make it up with a few days from before Rosh Hashanah. So you have 10 days that you fasted up to noon, not the full day. And Rav Nosen writes, Rabbeinu was much for those fasts. Also the fast of Behab and the Erev Rosh Chodesh up to noon. Rabbeinu wasn't against these fasts, which are accepted min hagim. It's Rabbeinu was warning of those people who did uh, optional fasts. Or in his time, it was Tani uh, Hafsaka for a whole week. The fast from Motzei Shabbos after Malav Malka until Friday before Shabbos. That Rabbeinu himself, he did it himself. He did it in one year, 18 weeks in one year. It's, it's, <laughs> you can't imagine, <laughs> who are we talking about? You know, 18 weeks in one year, he fasted from, from, from Shabbat to Shabbat. It's unbelievable. And then afterwards he said, if I would have known the greatness of the Bodhidut, of prayer, I would have never have, have, done, have fasted that much. Because now, if I would have known then, like I know now, that in my life, what you can accomplish through talking to Hashem, I wouldn't have done that. You would think the opposite. You know, you're killing yourself, you're working on yourself and everything. And he teaches, you don't know, that means you don't know the power of prayer. If you knew the power of davening, what it can do, accomplish much, much more. So you'd invest all your kochot, all your energy into that. So again, so we're stuck in a way. Rav Tzvi Cheshe on this year, I, I, I listened to the Torah at some of his classes, he said that Rav Nosen once said, for a year and a half it'll take him just to resolve Rabbeinu's dilemma of fasting or not fasting. Because it's, it's, it's not clear. Yeah, like I, said, I heard all the Tzvi that he has to go two weeks out of the Yishev. Two weeks in a row. In order to resolve it? To solve yeah. it. I heard he said a year and a half. I heard, I heard, yeshev or, uh, yeah, yeah. Chutz Yishev after for a year, not two weeks. For a year. Akopani. So now Rabbeinu will bring Every time Rabbeinu asks, it, not only in this field, every time he speaks about Tanis, he says, I don't know what to do. I exactly. Don't know what to do. There's another prayer, prayer one on one. Kufalif? Prayer one on one. Kufalif? 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 Oh no, sorry. Uh, tzadik something about Yom Kippur. Zayin. And then... Tzadik Zayin? What did you say? Tzadik Zayin. Tzadik Zayin. That's the Lama one. Zayin. Lama Zayin. No, no. There's a, there's a Tzadik one. There's a prayer where Nelson talks about Yom Kippur. Where Rabbi has that lesson that Yom Kippur is one day that includes all the years of the uh, all the days of the year, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. So in there also Rabbi Nassim, <laughs> he starts asking, I don't know what to do. And there, there is a lot. There elaborates a lot. Al Kopani. Bottom line, there's the idea of Tani, which we're going to develop. So now Rabbi brings his source to this. This idea what says in Kapitel Kufzain. Remember this Kapitel, because this Kapitel is very important for this Torah. And not, not only this, this Torah 62, which today will be the last year on this Torah, is connected to another Torah in the Kutimuan, Torah Kuf Samech Gimel 163. And in there, he says to look at Lesson 62. We're going to jump to Lesson Kuf Samech Gimel. There, he more elaborates on this Kapitel Kuf Zayn. Keep in mind, remember this chapter until 107, which talks about the Arba'a Shetzichim Nodo, the four have to give thanks to Hashem. So in there, you see, Rabbeinu is now quoting from that Mizmor. He's quoting from which one? The one who's sick. Miderech pish'am u'mi'avonatem yit'anu, right? Kol ochel teta'ev nafsham v'yagiu ad sh'am avid. He's talking about the guy of the four who have to give thanks to Hashem, the person who's sick, that he can't even eat anything. You give him food, he's so sick, he can't even open it, he can't accept any food anymore in his body. He can't take it. So Rabbeinu is quoting Dafka from that one. So he says, He explains, from their, their way, from their, their way of sinning, iniquities, and <coughs> transgression, yitanu. So as he's reading it like this. Be, from the way, those who have the pathways of sin, in other words, the goyim, who are not following the pathway of Hashem, pisham uvenatem, what to do to elevate it, yitanu. Also by yidin, if now, because the dibor has been trapped, the nitzotzei dibor has fallen, the sins and transgressions which have caused that the Dibur is in Galut, what to do? Yitanu. So Rabbeinu is reading the Pasuk like this. What to do? From the pathway of Pishaim, transgressions, and Avonot, iniquity, sins, what do I do to get out of that Derech? Yitanu. I have to do Tani. That's how he's rereading. And Derech is a lot associated with speech. It's elsewhere in the Kutemran. The idea of derech, right? Also on the Baki, that's in the, the, the Torah, Torah Vav, the derech of Kavanot Elul, right? 
So their derech mainly is through speech, that you're being a baki, right, so on baki b'shov, is that no matter what you're going through, you keep on davening to Hashem. You don't say, I don't need this anymore, I'm fed up, or I'm going through, which is also in this capital telling, Ya'lu shamayim yadu te'omot, coming up, you'll see in lesson 162, we'll get to a bezat Hashem, that a person is going through so many aliyot and yaridot in their life, they want to stop the derech of tshuva, which is mainly in talking, seeking out Hashem. Atziya she'ol hineka, when David Mar says in Torah Vav, I know I'm going to Torah Vav a little, but the idea is there of the derech, that the main thing that, that if I make my bed in hell, hineka, how can I, how do I find you here? Because I'm looking for you, Hashem. Im esak shamayim shamata atziya she'ol hineka, whether I'm going up, climbing upwards or going downwards in hell, I'm, I'm always connected to you, that's mainly through speech. The main thing is the dibor, that I keep on davening, I don't drop my davening no matter what I'm going through. Aliyot, yeridot, whatever, I keep on the davening. So derech is a lot associated with speech. And also Rabbeinu connects the of, of, of marriage, that the Isha is called the derech also, and because that's the idea of speech also. We won't go into that that much, it's not, it's not the place. But derech, big time, is connected to the idea of, of speech. He says to fast. That's his proof to this idea that the fast is what gets you out of the derech of the Pesha'in and Avonot, which caused the Dibur to be, in, the sparks of Dibur to be in Galut. Azai, you see what happens then? Yishlach Devaro. Unbelievable. Then when you activate the Ta'anit, so this now causes the Dibur, Yishlach Devaro. Yishlach Devaro can mean two things. Number one, you're elevating the sparks of the speech. And also the speech now, you're sending out the speech to collect as epoch el amim safa So it's a double meaning here. Okay, azai. So then what happens, what's coming up in the verse? Yishlach devaro v'yipayim. Again, talking about the person who's sick. Number two, right? Number two, number three. Number one is the guys in the midbar. Number two is chavush. One is in beta asurim, right? In jail. And number three is the one who's sick. And number four is the one who's in the yam, right? Am I right? Chaim, Chavush, no, the order is not the same there in Chaim, right? Chet, Yud, Yud, Mem is the Rashi Teva they give in Chazal to remember the, the four who have to give uh, thanks to Hashem. But in the, in the, in the capital of Zion, the order is number one is the guy who's in the, de- in the, the desert, and number two is the like Beit Asurin, the one in jail. Number three, Kol Ochel Tatev Nafsham, the one who's, who's mamash sick and he can't eat anymore. And the final one is your Dayayam. Again, remember this capital, it's very important for coming up with other details, Bezat Hashem. Okay. So Yishlach Dvaro, Ki Ikar Tikkun HaDibor, Wali Deh Tarit, this is proof, the main Tikkun of the Dibor, which is Yishlach Dvaro, you're now taking out the Dibor from, from, the, from the Klipot, from the evil, the t- and, and it's rectification afterwards to go out to collect, Wali Deh Tarit, this true Tarit, it just proved, Midech Pishan Umeav Notehem, Yitanu, etc, etc, Yishlach Dvaro, Ki Ikar Yenikat HaKlipot, Eino Ela Meachmer Kedusha, Okay, now he started, now we're going to the of Kabbalah, because the main place, Yenikata Klipot, the main nourishment of the Klipot, and we're going to see this more in Lesson 163 coming up, the main nourishment of the Klipot is only from what's called the back of the Kedusha. Enu Ela Meachorek Kedusha, the back of holiness, which we're going to see is referring to speech, because speech, which is not pure, is called Achar Advarim. Wherever you see the Torah, Vahi Achar Advarim Ha'ele, it's something which is negative. For example, in, in, uh, in Megillat Esther, right? Achar Dvarim Ha'ele, Gidal HaMelech Et Haman Ben Amadata, right? You see, after Achar Dvarim, after these things, but the, the actual translation is the Dibur. The Dvarim is Dibur. Achar Dvarim Ha'ele, and also the test of Avraham Avinu, Achar Dvarim Ha'ele, Hashem tested Avraham about the Akedah, so it's also a Nisayon, it's a difficulty. So Achor Dusha is referring to the back of holiness, which we we'll see is, is speech which is not perfect, which is not pure, not holy. That's what the people have their rule, from the back of the Kedusha. So he explains now, there's a back and there's a front. Give me Pnei Kedusha, Yevshalem Dinok. The Klippot, they cannot, the evil forces, they cannot gain nourishment from the face, the front of holiness. They can't. Mechamat Behirut, or because the light is pure, so the klipa, they have no hold, have no grasp. The klipa can only grab a hold only if there's some darkness in the area. That's an Achara Kedusha. The back of the Kedusha, we don't see the Chochmat Adam Ta'ir The light, the countenance is from the face. But in the back, there's darkness there. It's, it's shade. And from the shade, the darkness, that's when the klipa can have a hold to grab and to gain nourishment. Fine. So that's why, 
אלא לפעמים, it's just that, sometimes, נותנים להם מלמעלה, from heaven, נשמיים, from above, they give purposely permission, a permit, an okay, for them, the klipot, במכוון, בדווקא, intentionally, כוח לנהוג, they give them the ability, sorry, to, to gain nourishment from the פני הקדושה, from the face of holiness. Why from heaven do they do that? They intentionally let the klipot, you know, swallow up and take the פני הקדושה. וכל זה אינו אלא לרע להם. And this is only for their bad, for their evil, for their downfall. בחינת, like it says in Kohelet, idea of, את אשר שלט האדם באדם לרע לו. There's a time that one man rules over another man for his detriment, not for his benefit. לרע לו. To make it that, I'm going to say, for, for, for his destruction. This concept is found mainly in Lekut Emoran part 2, lesson 8. The idea of Chayil Bala Vaikeinu. That Davka, there's a high level of Kedusha, which allows itself to be, so to speak, Kivyachos swallowed up by the evil, in order that the, to destroy the evil. So in order to destroy the evil, the high level of Kedusha goes down there and destroys it, and smashes it. So that, there's this idea here also, that in order to destroy the Klippot totally, what they do is that they, they purposely allow a high level of Kedusha to go down, and to, 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 to break it, and then to elevate it. We'll stop at this point, but this is the idea also why you need a tzaddik. We're gonna go, I, I'm going off this because Rav Nassim, he talks about this idea. On your own, you're in danger, for sure. A person on their own, or, on their, own, or their own davening, their own strength, their own mitzvot, and that they face the evil that they have to face in life because they have to collect their holy spark. You have avedis. You have lost items which are trapped in the evil, and you have to, you have to get them no matter what. If you daven the tefillah shelo kavana, you have an achayit now. You have something that's on the other side you have to get back. A, Jew, a dibur of a yid is so precious. You have to realize that, that when a Jew speaks, these, these are the, 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 the letters that Hashem built the universe with. Hashem's building blocks is holy speech. And when a Jew speaks words of davening and in prayer, this is the pinnacle of creation. So when it's not done properly, the klipot are just dying <laughs> or living to grab them. They're just, they're, the evil is just yearning to get it because this is the whole source of all of the nourishment for all creation. And for the people to continue to exist, they want this negative nourishment. They want it. And it comes when a Jew speaks impure, I would say what, not complete words, words which are not complete with kavanah and holiness. So when you speak, it's unbelievable. When a Jew speaks, that's what runs the world, by the way. That's what runs the world. So we have an achrayut to get it. And uh, the, the ideas here are just phenomenal. But now again, because on my own I can't do this, I need the assistance of the tzaddikim who give me this push. They know how to daven. The tzaddikim know how to daven with force, with koach and everything. They're davening, their words, they're, 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 they're the p'nei akidusha. They bedafka let themselves be swallowed up by the evil to take them in. And that is for their detriment, to destroy them, to wipe out and to bring up. So that's why in this lesson also, it talks about that coming up. We're gonna, uh, I don't know if we're going to see it so much because we're going to go to the next lesson. But the idea of, of, of Shidu the Marechet, that the Tzaddik is able with davening to change nature, to change everything, because that's the power that's complete davening, complete tefillah. So no said he hints this, that I should, I should be attached to the Tzaddikim, that they can help me to retrieve what's mine, trapped in the klipot. How? The tzaddikim infuse me with this koach, and in their merit, in their koach, and the strength that they give me, for whatever reason, whether it's through their words of chizuk, or their schut itself, their kedusha, comes with me, and, I, and, and lets, allows this, the klipot to swallow me up, without knowing that it's high level of kedusha, in order to smash them, and to take back the holiness. This coming up, he's going to say, is the idea of Sarai Meinu, why she was taken into the house of Paro, all that was to fulfill what it says in Eshet Chayel. Tenula mi peri adeya. Give back to Sarah, who corresponds to the Hoda Dibor. The Sarah is this panim of the Kedusha. Complete holy speech of Avram. Avram and Sarah. Avram, Sarah, she was Sarai originally, right? She was my, my Melucha, my kingship, my, my mastery of, of speech. After it, Sarah means of the whole world. So once she became Sarah, so she had to go into the house of Paro, who is the, the climax, the spitz of the Tuma of the world at the time, Paro, 
and to go dafka into the Beit Paro, and therefore they're there to crash and get to break them and to let it collect all the holy sparks, which was shown in all the wealth, all the Ashirut that Avram and Sarah took out of Egypt, right? And also Esther, just to connect a little to the Megillah, she was given 127 nations of Achashverosh, right? The Midrash says, Rabbi Kiva says, why did this Tzadika, Esther Malka, have why, why did she marry? She married Achashverosh and became the queen of 127 nations, corresponding to the 127 years of Sarai Menu. The Midrash brings that connection between 127 and 127 to show that also Esther Malka going to be by Achashverosh to accomplish what, what Sarah did by going into Paro, but much more. Because Sarah came out, Esther Malka didn't come out, she stayed there. And that's why this, this Chag is until Mashiach comes, because the final rectification will only be at the end when Mashiach comes. The job of Esther and Mordechai is until Mashiach comes. That's why it's the, and even after. <laughs> and that's why it's the only Chag the Chazal teaches us, the only Chag that will continue to exist even when Mashiach comes is born. There will be no more Pesach, no more Shavuot, no more Sukkot, because everything is Zechel Yitzhak Mitzvah, right? Remember leaving Egypt? But Purim is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a Chag, which is connected to the, the, the Koach of it, comes from the future redemption, which is to show miracles within the Teva, and this Esther was the key for that. So again, Esther and Sarah Menu, and now the, the wealth that Sarah took out is also the wealth of the Osher of Beit Haman, which Esther gave to Mordechai also. And, all, and afterwards, what does it say in the Megillah? Many of the Goim converted, became Yidin. And that's the idea of this lesson, on a miniature scale. Back in the story of Purim was miniature, that many, not everybody, but many recognize that there's only Hashem. And when Mashiach comes, it's going to be Likro Kula B'Shem Hashem. Visit Hashem. So with this, we stop, we, fin we finish this class on Torah 62. We're going to start next week, 163, which is continuing where we left off here. You're going to see. How it matches perfectly, we're going to get into this. We're going to, it's going to start with the idea of Sarah and the Dibur. And we'll continue the Torah from the perspective of 163 and how it connects to Bezat Hashem, the Arba Shetzichim Neldot, the four have to give thanks to Hashem, Bezat Hashem. All right. This <laughs> <laughs> is amazing. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, you know, whenever you learn the Torah, the Kutim Moran, yeah, but whenever you do the Torah, the Kutim Moran, the follow up is the Tefillah. Say the Tefillah. See the Tzvila? How do I find it? You have Torah's Nosen. Have you seen Torah's Nosen before? There's Torah's Nosen in the back. He has a special mafteach to show you everywhere in the Kutei Alochus that Rav Nosen quotes this Torah. Because you have you have two types of the Kutei Alochus. You have the Kutei Alochus which is on the Torah. When the back you have the mafteach, the special mafteach in the back of the Kutei Alochus. It shows you all the Alochus on that Torah. But besides that, Rav Nosen sometimes in another Torah, in another discourse, will start quoting this Torah. And you want to see that also sometimes, because there's, there's also some chidush in there, some chidush in that you might, you, might, you might need. So he says, Rav in the, in the in the second version of this Torah. Here it is, see? He says, Hani birke de Rabbanan de Shanhei. He says, Birke de Rabbanan is connected to Amuna. Ish emunot rav berachot. He connects berachot to birkaim. And he says when it's a pikam in the Birkaim, it's basically as a pikam in the Muna. <laughs> he says it here. It's unbelievable how he says it. Here, this is the Torah that he found. This is the Rav Nassim says, Yazayu Masa Hashem. In 1824, he got this Torah. Here it is, here.